Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. We are the first ones out there who created a payment orchestration platform for payouts. We have the most extensive network overall, and we believe we have the best application and technical solution with a single API and a single application. That was Charles Rosenblatt, president of Pay Quicker, and he is our special guest on this episode, episode 202 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. Charles has a passion for conscious decision-making and a love for the growth potential that comes with working for smaller companies. PayQuicker is a global payments platform that does payments for the gig economy around the globe in 200 countries and 50 plus currencies. They are a complete white label solution that offers companies the capacity to pay in multiple currencies and with multiple payment methods, including virtual card, direct deposit, e-wallet, and even crypto. They have upwards of 80 employees and the company has been around for 15 years. Tune in to hear Charles talk about his journey to becoming the president, how they managed to secure a 99% retention rate, and where he sees the industry going in the next two to three years. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Charles. Thank you for being here, and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Greg, thanks for having me. Appreciate the time. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. If you don't mind, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, maybe a few things like that. Sure. I grew up in northern New Jersey. I I tend to say New York, but then people actually ask where, and I wound up saying northern New Jersey. I went to school out at Pomona College in California and then got my graduate degree at uh, Darden School at University of Virginia. I've been in the finance slash fintech space for you know my whole career, so almost about 25 years at this point. And I currently live in Richmond, Virginia. Okay, great. Well, let's talk about the company PayQuicker. So tell us what PayQuicker does. Sure. PayQuicker is a global payouts platform. We do payments for mostly the gig economy, marketplaces, 1099 workers around the globe into 200 countries and 50 plus currencies. We work with companies to help pay those folks. And we also work with companies who are just looking for the backend infrastructure in order to be able to do some of that themselves. Okay. Maybe give us a primary use case. Sure. So I can give you two use cases. One use case is paying out folks around the globe. So I'll use an example of someone like a Tupperware, who is a large client of ours. We pay Tupperware's field who are selling the Tupperware goods all around the country, all around the globe in over 50 countries in multiple currencies around the globe. We get them their funds in any way that they'd like. They can use a card. They can get it to their bank account. They can get it to a check. They can get it to an e-wallet in their local currency or even crypto if they decide they want to do that. Although, depending on when this goes out, people may not be (laughs) deciding to do that any longer. We create the platform for them. It's completely white labeled. So it looks, feels, and has the total experience of Tupperware or our client. That is our fully covered service. We have another service, which we just launched called Payouts OS, which is the first payment orchestration platform for payouts in the marketplace. Essentially, what that is doing is giving people the ability to get multiple partners on the back end at wholesale rates through one single API and one single application. So if you're a company that needs to pay marketplaces or vendors or people all around the globe, you can connect to our API and on every single payment, just kind of like Expedia does when you look up, do you want to get a hotel room in St. Louis for a night? It goes through 15 plus banks and partners, finds out the best rate and provides back to you the best rate or the quickest or whatever, based on whatever option you would like. Okay. And that's a relatively new product you said? Yeah. So we launched it at Finnovate about three months ago. But the fact is, it's been the underlying point to the platform that we've had for 15 years. So essentially, we're leveraging the technology that we've built and we updated in the last two years to basically provide that product now across multiple industries from marketplaces to clinical trials to gaming. When I say gaming, I mean e-gaming, not gambling. We basically can be used across any of these industries to make payments globally for the team. 
Okay. Okay. And how big is the company? And you can answer that based on number of employees, revenue, whatever you're comfortable. So the company is between 60 and 80 employees today. The company's been around for 15 years. We're in a period of relatively high growth for the company over the last couple of years. Our employee base has almost doubled as the business has grown. Okay. So 15 years ago, we didn't have the gig economy. What was the main emphasis back then? Well, it's interesting. Many would argue that the original gig economy was the multi-level marketing business, like the Tupperwares of the world. Oh, okay. And they've been around for 50, 60 years in some cases. And so one of the main client sets of PayQuicker when it first got started was the multi-level marketing industry. In fact, we're actually the largest payout provider in that industry today. So it has been gig economy all along, believe it or not. It's just the definition of gig economy has expanded tremendously in the last five or 10 years from folks who were selling goods through multi-level marketing companies in all sorts of type of areas to Uber and Lyft and all those other gig economy jobs that you can get today. Sure, sure. So do you think the main pain point, or maybe there's a couple, but you know, Obviously, it's even in your name, pay quicker, right? Getting paid quickly, right? So gig workers do their job and they want to get paid immediately. I mean, is that typically the main pain point? So I think there are multiple pain points. And I think some of this is very generational, right? So we did a study with a partner who actually looked at different generations and said, in the Gen X, Gen Y groups, they actually care more about how they're paid than when they're paid or what they're paid. So it's more about being able to put money in your e-wallet, getting access on a card, being sent to a bank account, or even as I talked about earlier, being paid to crypto. It's about that beneficiary directed choice on the back end. For others, it's about being able to pay quickly. So there are some of our clients who literally pay out hourly. So someone sells something and the, the person who gets the commission or the sales fee for that sale is paid out within an hour. So every client is very different, and our belief is offering as much choice as possible is absolutely the key because every client is different. Sure, sure. So what is your go-to-market strategy? Is it typically, a do you have a direct sales force? Do you have partnership channels or a little bit of both? We do a little bit of both. We have a direct sales force that is working with both inbound leads that we get from our marketing and candidly from just word of mouth, which is how I had learned about PayQuicker originally you know, understanding what's nice is our retention rate is up over 99%. So we get a lot of folks who just say, hey, you should be working with pay quicker. And we hear about them that way. But we have a great set of referral partners. In many of these industries, the same folks are involved in multiple parts of a transaction. So let me give you an example. I've talked about the fact that we are a payout provider. Well, in order to pay someone out, there has to be pay in. And there are a lot of great pay-in partners that we have who handle the merchant acquiring side of the house and do the pay-in. And then when they need to pay out to the folks on the back end in marketplaces and other places, those folks refer people to pay quicker. Okay, that makes sense. And then is the business model, is it SaaS-based or transaction fee-based or both? It is both. So our new Payouts OS platform is much more SaaS-based as a whole. We collect SaaS fees and I get wholesale rates from all of my partners, I'm passing on wholesale plus a very, very tiny transactional fee. So most of my revenue on that is from SaaS fees and people who were getting FX rates around 75, 100, 125 basis points can get FX rates around 11, 12, 15 basis points from me. So it's a massive reduction. I don't want to upcharge that. I rather have my money as a subscription fee overall. When we do our card, we're also a card program manager, and that's one of the ways we allow for people to pay out is through card. Cards tend to be more transactional based, as you probably know, through interchange and things along those lines is how we would make our money. Okay. Okay. And what would you say differentiates your company from your competitors out there? So I think there's twofold things, one of which is comes from Paul Beldum, who's our founder and still our CEO whose motto for the company is happy pays. And you think that's odd because our real customers, our biggest customers are the corporates, right? The corporates who are paying out to folks. But the whole company is centered around making sure there's payee satisfaction for the people in the end who get their money, work hard for their money and need to spend it. And I think that focus, which includes us having a 21 language call center in Rochester, New York, which is our home office, 
really underlies why we have clients who come to us and why one differentiating factor. The other differentiating factor and the reason why I joined PayQuicker was around our new Payouts OS product. We are the first ones out there who created a payment orchestration platform for payouts. We have the most extensive network overall, and we believe we have the best application and technical solution with a single API and a single application that basically saves the needs of, you know, you pick the name of a large company, Greg, so I don't call out anyone I shouldn't, but if there's a large company who wants to come in and wants to work with 10 different banks around the globe in order to make their payments, instead they can come to us, get wholesale rates and connect to one API as opposed to connecting to 10 different partners, which is 10 different technological integrations that their tech team needs to do. Do you typically see that scenario like a U.S. company with U.S. banks or can it be, is it a U.S. company that has to deal with banks across the world or could it be both, I guess? It could be both. We do have U.S. clients who pay out in the U.S. and those people really mostly use us for our interfaces. So remember I talked about the two different sides of our platform, the one where we're creating the whole custom card, custom interface and all of that. If you have U.S. payments, you're mostly using us for that because, candidly, U.S. payments are relatively easy and somewhat commoditized. The clients who really need us for the 10 banks are so that we can cover the 200 countries and 40 plus currencies based on our relationships with large partners all around the globe. Okay, that makes sense. It's ironic. I think it was yesterday I saw a headline that was talking about insurance companies, and I think it was talking more around auto insurance and things like that, where people want to be paid for their claim like immediately. I don't know if you're, you see that in the industry or if that's you know, a use case for you guys, but I just thought I'd bring it up since I saw that recently. It is fascinating. And, and the, one of the biggest use cases that we're in the middle of conversations with right now with some large insurance companies is around yeah, I'm probably dating myself a little by using Katrina as the disaster. You know, when a Katrina hits, we actually offer virtual cards, which can be issued immediately and immediately put on Apple Pay, Google Pay, or even connected to Venmo at no cost. And so what happens is if these folks get claims and they really need to get money to people in distressed areas, now we aren't judging whether the claims are right or not. That's for the insurance company to judge. But they'll send us a file and say, here are the 500 people who need to get $1,000 each. We'll get them a virtual card, which they can put immediately on Apple Pay, which allows them to immediately go to the store to solve their problems. So I do believe that speed of payment is something that is hypercritical. And ironically, we use the old school prepaid and debit MasterCard rails in order to do that based on our partnership we just signed with MasterCard. It's crazy to think it's not all this different modern technology, although Apple Pay and Google Pay help, it's really around leveraging these existing rails out there to solve problems in a much more expedient fashion than they've been able to be solved before. Okay. And I think that this is kind of a similar question, or at least along the same lines, is where do you see the payments industry headed in, say, the next two to three years? You know, if I had a nickel for every time, no. Uh, it's, <laughs> It's interesting to talk about that, right? Because I do use the old statement that if you ask 100 people, one person will be right out of the 100. And then you ask again in a year, and it will be a different person out of the 100 who's going to be right. But from my perspective, it's really going to be boiled down to much more simplicity. I think ironically, things have gotten a lot more complex, whether again, whether it be with crypto or whether it be with all these companies who are coming into the space as a whole. I think that driving simplicity, driving a single point of contract, driving ease at the corporate level, I think companies who want to do pay-ins, pay-outs, or anything involving in payments want to keep it simple. They want to have one or two partners in order to do it, which is a departure from where they've been over the last many years. I used to run rewards programs at large banks, and there were some banks that would have 40 partners because they wanted to make sure they had the absolute best in class in each of the 40 areas. And there are others that said, I want to have two because I don't want vendor management to manage them all. And my gut feel says people are going to move back to if they can find one aggregated source who partners with a whole bunch of folks, but really have one hand to shake, so to speak, that's where things are going to move in the payment space in the partnership realm overall. 
Okay. You know, it's interesting because I think it's sort of removing friction, right? It's the friction of vendor management. It's the, I think consumers driving that frictionless kind of experience. And obviously, you know, you talked about some more recent technologies in the whole Apple Pay and Google Pay and all those. So, I mean, I think there's a, there's a consumer driven part of the equation. And then to your point, there's a, let's remove the complexities of a, you know, solution if we can. Yeah. And I'll take that into the area of cross-border payments, which I think is interesting because I've been involved with it for many years, but still, you know what the safest way to get money to London is with the least error rates, et cetera, today? Probably MoneyGram or some... No, <laughs> some... booking a flight on British Airways with oh. <laughs> a suitcase of cash and bringing it over. There you go. Right? Error rates on wires still run 1% to 2% overall. Even with all the modern technology, things get held up. And there's a whole level of simplification that I think things like stablecoin will help with. But I think having payment companies sort of evolve based on the and sort of evolve the current infrastructure and banks are great. You know, we partner with a ton of them. But today, banks can do one thing. They can pay other banks. And as people want to start paying into e-wallets and paying into friends accounts and looking at different ways for their businesses to be able to thrive and spend money like card. I think all of that just can be simplified and I think will be simplified in the next two to three years. Doing things domestically isn't all that hard. Doing things cross border is still pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds like there's still plenty of opportunity there. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. One could argue you make your own opportunity, right? I've spoken with fascinating companies still that are in the very early stages of growth. And one thing that amazes me about the fintech community, having been in it for so long, is the plethora of amazing ideas. And where companies tend to fail is really much more on the execution than the idea. Because I've heard some, even in the last you know 12 months, even going to Finnovate and watching other presentations outside of ours, there are some amazing ideas out there and things that I think can create that simplification that we need. You're probably familiar with the words buy now, pay later, how it has grown exponentially over the past couple of years and is still one of the hottest trends in payments. It's become a norm for retailers to provide a buy now, pay later payment option for their customers, many of whom no longer want to use credit cards for larger purchases. Business leaders are tasked with finding a payment solution that offers a seamless digital customer experience that results in increased sales. Citizens Pay is a buy now, pay later solution created by citizens that helps retailers drive sales and increase loyalty by providing customers with transparent installment financing, longer repayment terms, and a dedicated line of credit for repeat purchases. It's also optimized for merchants looking to offer a payment option to consumers with more mature and sophisticated purchases in mind, like a new living room set, fitness equipment, or a kitchen appliance. With Citizens Pay, merchants have the security of a leading national bank and an omni-channel platform designed to streamline the buying process. If you want to learn more about Citizens Pay, follow the link in our bio or visit citizenspay.com backslash podcast, where you can find additional information about Citizens Pay and the Buy Now, Pay Later payment model. This podcast is part of a paid partnership between Citizens Pay and the Leaders in Payments podcast. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. So tell us about your journey to your role as the president there at Pay Quicker. Sure. It's a, a long and winding journey, which I'll try to keep somewhat on the shorter side as opposed to others. But I started my career you know, in the hedge fund world, left that and moved into banks. So I spent a long time at Capital One running their MasterCard Visa relationships, running their co-brand partnerships with people like Kmart and Lowe's, running parts of their rewards program, and then spent some time at Washington Mutual doing a lot of the same things as well as running account management for a piece of my time. And then sadly, I remember very clearly, I don't know how many listeners will remember in 2009 or 2008 when Washington Mutual blew up and then was acquired by Chase, I kind of said to myself, I don't think I'm going back to a large bank again. I was always running innovation groups and product groups at different companies. 
And I said, you know, I things out completely outside of my control caused the Washington Mutual stuff to happen. And I just said, I I want to control my career and I want to control what I'm doing more. And, you know, if I'm going to bet on anything, I'm willing to bet on myself and my capability to build a big team and a good team and grow. And so I did consulting for a, a long period of time. I was fortunate enough to have a lot of clients who reached out to me and, and wanted my help and were part of a couple of consulting firms before 2014 came along. And I had this client called HyperWallet. HyperWallet was one of the leaders in the payout space. And I was fortunate to help join them and, and help them get to a point where they were able to sell to PayPal a couple of years later. I then went on entrepreneurial journey myself, helping to co-found slash be employee number one, actually, of a payout startup. We lasted about three years, although the company's still in existence in a different form than it was today. When I was fortunate enough to have a conversation with Scott Gallat, who is the CEO at Payoneer, and Scott asked me to come over as the chief strategy officer as we were entering an exciting time going public through our SPAC transaction that we did. You know, I helped guide Payoneer through that transaction, running different parts of the organization. But when push came to shove, I think personally, from a fulfillment perspective, I love working at smaller companies, being able to really be part of everything and manage everything and grow. And ironically, I have known Paul Beldum, the CEO at PayQuicker, who was a competitor of HyperWallet at the time seven years ago, uh, known him from then, always admired the company. Always thought the technology there was actually top notch, even better than the technology at places like HyperWallet. And Paul and I started chatting and I talked about what he really wanted and how he wanted to grow and what his plan was. And Paul basically brought me in as president of banking as a service. I've come on as president of the company and setting up to be able to take this and grow the company even further over the next coming years. Okay. Okay, great. So what are some things you're passionate about? So maybe one work-related passion and one personal passion. I'll start with the personal passion because I am a diehard Seahawk fan, which made yesterday, well, given when this recorded, maybe not yesterday at that point in time, but given the last few weeks of losses, to be <laughs> tremendously painful. In fact, I think this year is the first game I've missed watching on television or in person in almost 20 years. So that's a passion of mine personally, as well as I have four young boys. And so clearly my wife and my four boys take up the vast majority of my time and, and caring and passion when I'm away from the office. When I'm in the office, it's sort of a weird thing. What I'd say is what I really care about overall is conscious decision making. I've been through so many organizations where things, either people have a woe is me mentality or things happen or making choices without understanding the outcomes. And what I really value in the team, in the way people do business and the way people think is really this concept of making conscious decisions, of making decisions where you're making a, you know what the outcome is going to be, or you have an idea of what the outcome is going to be. You're looking out for all the parties, whether it's a payee, a payor, the employees, or vendors or partners, and making decisions that you believe are going to benefit the most, understanding the risks and the fact that it may not benefit others, but making that decision in a conscious fashion instead of letting it come to you. Okay. Well, I have to ask. So if you are from New Jersey, you went to school in California and then in Virginia, how did you become a Seahawks fan? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so maybe contrarian in a way, my family had giant season tickets when I was young and I'll kind of give away my age by talking about the time period. But I went to, I didn't want to be a Giants fan like everyone else in my family was. And I went to see a game with Jim Zorn and Steve Largent and Kenny Easley and Kurt Warner. And I said, God, I really like these guys. They're pretty cool. And you know how hard it was, by the way, in the 80s to watch another. I basically got to see them once a year. It would be following the ticker at the bottom of the screen. It'd be the only way I'd even be able to. And reading box scores the next day. So anyway, you know, I was a kid. I like the players. And I've been a Seahawk fan now for 40 plus years through some really, really painful years with Dennis Erickson and folks and through some really good years recently until, well, I would say until this year, but they're doing okay. Yeah, yeah. I think the trade was a big surprise, right? Not to get off on football. This is about <laughs> payments, but I thought it was an interesting trade that they made with, you know, trading away their star quarterback, but... 
that's probably for another podcast. It probably is for another podcast, but it's actually a really valuable lesson. I take it back to the conscious decision making, Greg, is that they'd given up a bunch of draft picks when they took Adams on. They said, we need to restock. And what does it matter for us to have this really high paid, really good quarterback, or at least thought to be good quarterback, if the rest of the support is not good enough? So let's bottom out, let's get some draft picks and let's grow, right? And again, that was a conscious decision they made. They could have kept Russell Wilson and assuming Russell Wilson was decent, right? They would be eight and nine and wind up with a mediocre draft pick and not be able to grow for the future. And I think especially as we look in the startup world or even pay quicker, which is you know a smaller company, those staffing decisions, I brought in a brand new head of product from Apple, but there are other decisions you have to make where you can afford some things and not afford others. And making those decisions in the corporate world, candidly, will make or break probably my revenue next year and a lot of companies, whether they succeed or not. So, you know, sometimes you can take lessons from football, even if, as you said, the expected outcome was a little different than the one you originally thought. Right, right. Well, I'm glad you brought that back to your business because I was struggling with how I was going to connect that. (laughs) So thank you for doing that. One last question, and I always like to get people's different perspectives on this. And it's really about the whole fintech space, which, you know, when I started in payments and and probably you too, the word fintech didn't even exist. But now it's become fintech payments, whatever you want to call it. It's an industry that I think people coming out of college look into, right? And they say, hey, that's a that's a hot space. There's a lot of innovation, a lot of money being invested. You know, it's an interesting place to build a career or work. What would your advice be to them? They're coming into this industry. What would you tell someone to do to be successful coming into the payments or fintech space? I think it's about finding what you're good at, what you enjoy and what your niche is. So I joke with folks And I'm sure you could probably tell the same joke if it was funny. But when people asked me when I was leading teams at Capital One, Washington Mutual, I said, oh, yeah, when I was an eight year old, I had a dream to run a credit card division. (laughs) Right. Like that's not what you dream about. But what you do dream about is being really good at what you do, earning the respect of your colleagues and earning the respect of the people you work with. I mean, I've seen this happen over and over. The same people I negotiated a deal with, I use MasterCard's example, The last three companies I was at, I negotiated our deal with MasterCard with the same person on the other side. The first time I actually gave the deal to Visa. And then I dealt with that same person and negotiated and we knew each other. She knew me. I knew her. I knew we had a back relationship from there. And it's really helpful. So my advice to people is it's really important how you act with people. It's really important how you Make that first, second, and third impression because the payments and fintech space is very small. You're going to run across the same people over and over and over again. And you want to treat them the way you would want to be treated. And that will allow you to grow. And then learning, I started at a hedge fund called D.E. Shaw. And there, you know, they basically hired someone who had a PhD in economics the same way they had hired someone who had a PhD in philosophy. They said, we just want a smart person. Economics and finance can be taught. And I believe that's something that you can decide what you want to do and you can get taught what you want to do. But how you treat the people that you're going to run into over and over is going to make or break how successful you are in in your career, especially in fintech. Yeah, I think that's very good advice. Well, Charles, we've covered a lot of ground about pay quicker, about the industry and about you and your journey. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, I want to you know thank you for the time and reiterate my excitement, actually, for not only what we're doing at pay quicker, but what's going on in the industry as a whole and through podcasts like yours and other outlets. I think being able to talk about this as a whole and invite further conversation is critical. So I appreciate you taking the time and what you do with your podcast. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks again for being on the show. I know your time is very valuable, so I really appreciate you being here. Great. Have a nice day. Happy holidays. Yeah, same to you. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 